Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming. Um, this is very, very surreal. Um, like Cameron mentioned, I was part of TIFF Next Wave. Um, and before that, I also was a juror at TIFF Kids or Sprockets. Um, wow. And uh, this festival and this home, um, you know, offered a community and a world to me that made me want to become a filmmaker. Um, Show the Baby, my first film, played here in 2020, and that was like such a dream come true, um, except for the fact that it was 2020. And uh, <laughs> I was here in this theater with Cameron and my parents, who are also here tonight, um, and there were 30 people in this audience um, because, because of the pandemic and the restrictions. So um, to be here with my second film um, and to see a, a full house um, is, it feels like sort of what I, this feels like what I was waiting for with Shiva Baby, like with when I got into TIFF um, in 2020. So this is incredibly surreal and special um, and emotional. Um, so thank you so much for being here. Like it, it really means the world to me and to my parents um, and, and to so many of my, my friends who are here. Um, thank you, Alicia, and also Cameron is back there um, for wonderful intros. Um, uh, if anyone hasn't checked out Alicia's work, they should. She's incredibly talented um, and motivates me all the time. Um, uh, this movie, like, I'm not going to say too much about it because <laughs> it's, it's its own journey and I'd rather you just sort of take it all in. Um, but it was made with a lot of wonderful, uh, talented people uh, who can't be here tonight, including Rachel Sennett and Iowa Devery, who star in the movie. Rachel co-wrote the movie with me. She was also in my first movie. Um, and they send their love and they wish they could be here. Um, so yeah, enjoy the movie, um, and we'll see you after for a conversation. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks guys. Woo! Woo! Uh, now? Oh yes, there we go. Um, well, I was just saying I love the movie. It's my fourth time seeing it, and every time I see it, there's like new details. I noticed that are really funny, and I think that's just because there's so much visual splendor and every mm. detail has been really thought out by you, which is amazing. Um, yeah, I feel like what this movie does so well is like, it's My timely. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's timely, but it's also timeless. It's like you took this classic thing, this high school teen movie, and you made it queer, and you made it self-aware. Can you talk a little bit about the genesis of the idea? Yeah, um, I think that I just wanted to make like something gay and stupid, you know what I mean? Um, I'm just like kind of tired of having to use my brain when I see myself on screen. Um, I, I just wanted to make like a, a teen sex comedy, but have, have queer people in it. And I think when I started writing it with Rachel, um, that's when it sort of became the level of absurdity that it became because that's much more in her style of humor, which I love and uh, had so much fun writing within that space. Um, but that was definitely like driven by her love for camp. Um, and so then we revisited like a lot of those campy kind of teen movies from the late 90s and early 2000s. <laughs> yeah. I feel like even though it is camp, it's still so relatable. There's so many jokes about like being a woman <laughs> um, and it being hard. And I feel like, you know, it's so funny because when I, sorry to all the sports fans, but when I look at the like football parts, I'm like, is this camp or is this like actually how it is? <laughs> um, and I feel like you did a good job of kind of like showcasing the absurdity of the obsession, like the American football world. Um, it was really funny. <laughs> Thank you. It yeah. wasn't a question, um, it was just okay. a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. And one thing that I think is becoming like really apparent when I watch all of your movies is you have such a strong visual style. And I know that you worked with Maria Rushi again from Shiva Baby. And, you know, this movie has so many like great wide shots where there's like something funny happening in the background, people in the foreground and all these kind of like funny push-ins like to emphasize these dramatic moments. Um, can you talk about like crafting the cinematic style with your DP and like how that process was? Totally. Um, yeah, I was lucky enough to work with Maria again. And 
Yeah, I mean, I think that we looked towards comedies um, uh, that had like a lot of action and, you know, things happening, like you said, on like m multiple focal planes. So like there could always be multiple jokes happening within the frame, like Zoolander and Anchorman and um, even like Scott Pilgrim and, and a lot of like, like Shaun of the Dead, et cetera. Um, we were uh, looking at a lot of those um, and Bring It On was a really big one. Um, <laughs> And yeah, I mean, I the process was kind of the same. We just watched a bunch of references, and then and then we narrowed it down and just started shot listing and you know using like a little, like uh, we did like a Lego set for for Shiva, and for this we just like drew a thing and used little stick figure things, and yeah, it was the, the same thing. <laughs> that we're getting like the director's commentary. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and, you know, kind of you reference like Edgar Wright movies, and I feel like you have so many visual jokes in this, which are really like strong. Like anytime there's like text on screen, it's a joke. Some of my favorites being, wh what is it Who Invented Feminism? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Who Invented Feminism, um, the guy that gets hit with the fruit cup and is like, that's it, and starts writing like, I'm gonna bomb the school. Did those things, like, were they in the script or did like, you come up with them later? Um, most of them were in the script, but I think that um, once we started working with our production designer, Nate Jones, who's wonderful, he and his team felt really encouraged and excited to like keep that level of visual irony like going. And so they would come up with like so many different signs for things, or he'd have ideas for like, you know, like that there's like a painting of Jeff, like the Sistine Chapel, like behind them, like, and it's like the Last Supper, like, like things were like added um, from uh, his team and, and from our costume designer um, that sort of elevated what was already written in the script, which like I have to give Rachel credit for like all of those like background jokes and anything that's written. Yeah, I've seen it four times now and like every time I watch it, I'm like, the poster that's like smile he might be watching or something <laughs> there's just so many funny details and i think that just like takes the comedy to the next level like obviously the acting is super funny and the writing's funny but the world that you created is like it's funny not to reuse the word funny for the 15th time but yeah um something else that i'm kind of like adding to the Emma Seligman trademarks is like iconic music mm -hmm. and i feel like with Shiva Baby the score was very like adding to the anxiety so much and it really like yeah brought you to that anxious place and then in this movie like the score is also amazing and you have like such specific funny songs in like very great moments one being total eclipse of the heart and the other being what i'm interpreting as a homage to your canadian heritage <laughs> complicated by emma lafine <laughs> did you like watch a cut and we're like it's complicated or were you like ahead of time this song is perfect for this moment complicated was written into the script um oh my God, I love it. but uh <laughs> but the other songs we had to sort of figure out in the edit and um even total clips of the heart total clips wow because well, it feels so perfect with like the moment i'm glad you think so um <laughs> uh well we had um when we filmed uh nick nicholas uh Galantine, um doing his like dance inside, we like um, gave him just a few different like tempo options to do that. So I, I, I guess it was like, it, we chose that on set for him to dance to. And then our producer was like, well, now we gotta have that in the movie. Yeah. Um, and then uh, it was really um, expensive. So we, <laughs> uh, we debated like other songs, um, but that one worked the best. So it wasn't written in, but I guess we kind of, yeah, figured it out maybe when we were shooting it. Yeah, it's really funny because it's about like an eclipse and then like a bomb goes off, so like it feels <laughs> so specific. But yeah, I remember when I first saw it and like the first bars of Complicated come on, like everybody was laughing and I was like, she's Canadian, guys, don't forget it. <laughs> anyway, um, I think we can move on to the audience questions. I'm sure there's burning questions that you all have for Emma. Okay, there's going to be a microphone that you're going to get. So we'll wait for that to be... The suspense. Um, I was just wondering, um, was it always your intention to have the film like a satirical heightened reality that 
was kind of like over the top and like the the males are extra toxic and like uh, you have to fight with the football team at the end where you just kill everyone so I was just wondering if you talk about that yeah um totally yes it was always meant to be heightened and satirical in fact I think it used to be much more so um and then we kept on getting notes to like make it more emotional and to like care about the characters or something and um, <laughs> uh, so that was always the intent for sure um I, the ending though came later on in the writing process i remember like we couldn't figure out how to solve sort of like them winning but have it feel climactic um and originally josie was just going to prevent jeff from like drinking a water bottle that had pineapple juice in it and it didn't feel enough anyway but so rachel came up with that ending i remember um we, we couldn't figure it out so that was new but the but the rest was was always meant to be yeah heightened mission accomplished <laughs> um there's a question right here oh. yeah it's coming when it comes to shooting comedies i'm sure that like when you wrote the script and then when you got to the set there might have been, I, actually, I should probably phrase this like a question. Was there ever a time when like, you wrote it and then when you're on set, you're like, oh, this is not at all how I thought it was going to be like? And if it was, then how did you, I guess, adjust to make it still fit the vision you initially had? Yeah, um, that's kind of stuff I feel like I black out because I'm like, wait, it's not working like how I wanted it to. What am I going to do? And then you just kind of like have adrenaline get to you and you figure it out. But um, um, I mean, I think that I, I really try to prep as much as possible. And that doesn't mean that, you know, problems will completely be avoided. But I never feel like, oh my God, wait, this isn't like what we wrote, like what? Like this doesn't make any sense. Usually I figure that part out in the rehearsal or when I'm blocking it with my DP and she's like, but what's going on over here? Or what's going on over there? And I'm like, uh, I guess it doesn't really make sense. Um, so I don't know. I think that like you're always just having to adapt and, and cut down on shots and you know what I mean? Like try different things with the actors. And so I feel like I feel like the answer is kind of like that's just sort of like happens every day and yet also like I don't know there's no there's no one moment where you're like ah we got here wait uh it's perfect or wait it's not because I think there's so many layers and there's so many opportunities and prep for all the departments to add to it and to enhance it and etc so, mm -hmm. sorry if that doesn't really answer yeah, that answered it and I think um I know you've also talked about like there being improv that's happened and you kind of being like yeah facilitating that and like letting the moments breathe that's one example yeah when like the actors are improvising and it's going out of control and you're like wait like does the scene make sense anymore like because now we're like off talking about Mathieu and like you know <laughs> like the church or whatever and I'm like wait what this isn't what we wrote um so which that was that part was improvised completely um so yeah I think when it comes to that you just have to like try to keep your hat on and be like, what is the scene? Like, what do we need to accomplish like to get out of here? You know, like, okay, they're just like gonna get expelled. Oh no. And then like get out of the room, you know? Um, yeah, I think just trying to like come back to your intention as much as possible mm -hmm. is always like what helps me. Yeah, the balance of having the plan, but then the space for like those magical moments to happen, like that long car monologue about the church situation. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, there is a question right there. Hi, um, I was just wondering if there was anything that was cut in either like the writing or the filming or editing process that you like really wish had made it in or you wonder how people would have reacted to it? Totally. Yeah, there's quite a lot. Um, like I said, it used to be more absurd. Um, but I mean, I'm very happy with what we ended up with because you have to kill your darlings all the time. Um, but originally the movie started at this weird camp um, and it started on... Um, it was literally camp. It was, it was camp. It was like a... It was a conversion therapy camp, but it was like a camp for horny teen girls um, where they're like sent to and it was like kind of like a military camp. And it started on Josie and PJ both masturbating in their bunk beds. Um, and yeah, I mean, people just at test screenings like didn't really know 
what was going on and we were like no it's like this is going to be where they actually were they weren't at juvie they were at this weird camp which is embarrassing um but like ultimately people thought this was going to be like a funny version of like handmaid's tale or something which like wasn't <laughs> the goal wow. so we had to cut that out unfortunately um and that sucked, uh, but maybe there's a short film in the future. Everybody email Orion to put this in the DVD extra so we can all see it. Any other questions? Um, let's stay over there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I noticed the phone book and the Motorola Razor. So I'm just curious, like what your time period this was set in and then what that era means to you. That's amazing. That's actually um, my favorite part. Uh, I didn't over, we didn't want it to like have any specific time period and, and I, we really didn't want it to have phones and, and social media and stuff. Um, but then when we had to have him on the phone, we just sort of like made a game time decision and we we're like, let it be a razor. Um, uh, and I think that felt appropriate to me because like the movies that inspired this the most were the teen movies like from the early 2000s. Um, uh, and that's like the nostalgic place like this held in my heart. So that's why we went for the phone book and the razor. It's weird to say it's my favorite part, but it literally is my favorite part because it's just so unexpected and yeah, I laugh every time. I can shout. So oh, it's okay. There's a uh, microphone coming. Uh, he's really good at yelling. I'm really good at yelling. <laughs> so um, I want to say, first of all, both your films really nail tone. I think one of the hardest and best things about film is when you nail tone. So you talked a little bit about the film references that you watched before. <clears throat> so like P.T. Anderson and other people that, that really nail tone as well kind of do that with their crew. They watch. Can you talk a little bit about sort of how you talk with the editor and the process either pre, during, and post, and how you kind of get to that tone? Yeah, I think that for both uh, movies, tone is and, and was the hardest thing to achieve always, and I hear that from other directors too, especially when you're doing some sort of genre combo, you know, like action comedy or horror comedy or whatever it is. Um, and yeah, it changes so much, like, like I said earlier, it started so absurd. And then, you know, once we were shooting it, the performances of the actors changes that, you know what I mean? Like it enhances it or makes it feel more real and emotional or more absurd. And you're like looking at something and you're like, that's actually way too crazy for this movie. You know what I mean? You're like looking at something and you're like, that's not what I imagined it to be. So the edit is a huge important part about that because that's obviously where you're making those final decisions and score affects that and even like, color you know what I mean we had there's a lot of things that were cut from the movie but are still in the background because originally like it was in your face and it was again at test screenings people were like what is going on um like the there's like a football player getting a blow job in the back of the classroom and like the the mascot has like a giant human penis and um is that still in there yeah but in the background yeah and see that on watch five yeah anyway Tom's tricky <laughs> and back to the question, I love it. Um, be right here in the middle-ish row. <laughs> hey Emma, it's Mia. Are they taking you on a date tonight? <laughs> <laughs> like to take you out on a date. Um, no, I do have a question. Don't we all? Um, I love the film. Um, thank you for sharing it with everyone. Um, my question is, can you speak to the editing process in your film? And I'm curious how you found a home with Orion Pictures for the film and why it was the right place. Thank you. 
For sure. Um, uh, in terms of the edit, I worked with the same editor from Shiva Baby, and um, we it was really experimental because there was so much improv in this movie. So uh, I think we had to change our process because on Shiva, like we knew exactly what each scene needed to be, and there wasn't really much room for variation. And it was very clear. And on this, I needed Hannah to sort of like have more fun and then I would like come back to her as opposed to sort of like having a festival deadline and being like we need to get this done and like being there every second of the way for the edit it was much sort of more collaborative this time like in a different way where I would step back and then come back and see what she'd been up to and trying new things and and using different jokes um but it was it was hard because when there's so much improv like you're like, oh, we, we want to keep everything, but then suddenly the scene becomes about something else completely. Um, so it, we like went in so many different directions. And I think especially because I'm someone who like needs to see everything, like every option, like I need to like go through all of that before like making the best choice. It, it was tiring and took a lot. Um, and then to your second question about Orion, um, uh, we just pitched uh, every studio and no one wanted us um, and uh, there was one place that kind of wanted us a little bit but wasn't really clear and then Alana Mayo who runs Orion had just gotten hired to sort of like rebrand Orion and, and make more queer stuff and, and female stuff and, and POC stuff and just like do it and do it for young people and she just came on board immediately and like knew exactly the movie that we wanted to make which is so rare like with a studio head um and her and and everyone at orion is like a young woman and like just super cool and you know she's queer and felt invested and like you know doing this um so i feel very lucky with with being with them with orion any other questions <laughs> The breaks are a good chance to meditate, reflect on the movie. Yeah. <laughs> um, first of all, congrats on the amazing movie. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering how Charlie XEX got involved. I saw her name. I had the biggest smile when Party For You came on. Oh, that's, uh, that's one. I love that song. Um, uh, Charlie got involved. Uh, she, she's like one of my favorite musicians and, um, I listened to her music uh, like all the time, especially while writing Bottoms, like most of her music was on the playlist. Um, and I was really lucky because she'd seen Shiva and was a fan of it and um, DM'd Rachel and they became friendly. And then Charlie did a song for Rachel's other movie, Bodies, 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 that came out last summer. And then she offered to do a song for Bottoms. Um, and then I was just like, when am I ever going to get an opportunity like this with like Charlie XCX asking to do something? So I was like, do you want to just do the score? And then um, she was like, OK, but if we do it, then I just don't think it would be a typical score. I'd want to use my my voice as an instrument. Um, and I was so excited. And then she worked with um, Leo Bernberg. Uh, so she and her team created like the, the palette and, and on all the major themes that we hear repeated throughout the movie. and. Um, you know, most of the important cues. And then Leo took all of that and cut it to picture and, um, you know, wove it together and, and made it transitional. Uh, but she was like a dream to work with. Yeah. Great question. Hi, really liked the movie and something that really drew my attention was all the costumes and they seem to reflect a lot of time periods and the characters' personalities. So I was wondering how you were involved with like the costume making and the designer. Yeah, um, thank you for asking. Uh, I Part of sort of wanting to make the movie feel timeless came from wanting um, the costumes to feel like they were coming from different eras of movies, especially teen movies. And I think with both costumes and our production designer, we took reference from a lot of like old Americana movies like Grease and, and American Graffiti, but then also like, uh, Y2K movies. Um, so uh, Eunice uh, Jara Lee, our costume designer, was incredible, and I presented her with this whole board from movies from like so many different eras, and I think it like freaked her out because I was like, it's gonna be like this, but also that, and like Isabel's got to look like she's in Greece, but Britney's from like Ten Things I Had About You, um, <laughs> and um, she did such an amazing job um, at taking all my crazy ideas and making it cohesive. I think, um, which was a hard task. Uh, 
but but she was wonderful and of course you know worked with the cast to make sure that they liked everything and you know felt good and something that many have noticed is the football players are always wearing the football uniforms <laughs> and the hilarity of Jeff's like jersey just saying Jeff at the back <laughs> and him kind of always being like Jeff. <laughs> Hilarious. Any other questions? That's so hard to choose. Her trepidation about giving it a title that was so like sexually suggestive and maybe not like popularly understood as uh like being something that might relate to queer women um yeah uh it took a while to figure out what the title was um originally we just kept calling it untitled gay high school movie um <laughs> and then we realized we needed a title and we created a short list and there was a lot of like cheesy ones like bottoms up and bottoms down or whatever um <laughs> And then we just settled on bottoms, because um, I like a good double entendre, you know, like with, with they're losers, but they're gay. And um, uh, no, we didn't get any pushback at all. Um, but yeah, maybe we would have had another studio, but I, I was like, did, did you see the movie? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like, yeah, the title isn't any more the title's the crazy, famous yeah, racier than, than the movie itself. I mean, I don't, or maybe it is, I don't know. Yeah, maybe they're equally, yeah, bold. <laughs> Any other questions? Hi, first of all, I've been waiting to see this movie for so long and finally getting to see it. Definitely lived up to my expectations. Um, my question was, you were talking about earlier how you wanted to make a queer movie, but it wasn't focused on them struggling with their queer identity or that wasn't the main point of like, a sad, there's a lot of sad queer movies. How did you integrate that kind of with like, you want to make like a camp high school comedy while also integrating like queer joy and them kind of celebrating their queer identities? Uh, thank you. Um, I think that it was a balance. Um, I, I definitely didn't want the, their queerness to be like the plot because, you know, we don't need any more of that. Um, but uh, I think that uh, we also didn't want it to feel too sweet and wholesome, you know what I mean? Because I also think that, I mean, it's so wonderful that we've now had joyful representations of like queer teen on, teens on screen because for so long we didn't have any of that at all. But now there's quite a lot of like, they hold hands and like, that's it, you know what I mean? And like, <laughs> good for them, they don't have like any sexual thoughts in, in their heads at all. Um, so um, yeah, it was a tricky balance. We wanted them to like have happy endings, but we also didn't want it to be like, overly sweet and sanitized. So we just tried to figure it out. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so excited for this question now. <laughs> wow, thank you. I've been waiting a while. Um, <laughs> I really enjoyed the movie. Thank you for sharing it with us. And so my question is, you've talked about wanting to make a movie that you wish you had seen when you were a teen and like all these influences in wardrobe. And I noticed in the last um, segment of the movie, the slow-mo on the football field, it reminded me of a lot of Across the Universe, the I want to hold your hand sequence, mm -hmm. where like the lesbian cheerleader is singing, you, you, I think you know the scene. So I just wanted to know if there were any specific influences in this movie that you took from for like scenes, plots, writing, like, or if it's all just like a mishmash. Um, from queer movies specifically, or queer scenes, um, um, I think it's just a mishmash. I mean, like, I feel like, but I'm a cheerleader in there a, a bit um so is deb's um uh white hot american summer isn't a queer movie but there's a queer storyline in it with bradley cooper um and that that worked its way in there um that that's so funny i hadn't thought about across the universe i mean i'm, I'm so happy i love hearing that especially when i'm like oh i didn't see that at all our references for that were like braveheart and <laughs> like 1917 um uh but that's awesome i'll say that now so that makes more sense i have time for one more question yeah. 
In the beginning, I noticed that the awkward, the, sorry, the dialogue was awkward in a good way, and I was wondering, did you guys like go to high schools to research, like how high schoolers talk? And, like, yeah. So that's a comp that's a really strong compliment. Thank you. <laughs> the accuracy. Um, no, we didn't. Um, <laughs> We didn't. Uh, I wonder if we should have, but no. Um, Rachel and I were, I guess, good at being awkward. I mean, <laughs> they're friends. They're like best friends, so I think their dialogue is quite natural often, and they improv quite a lot um, throughout the movie, especially in that first scene. Um, but no. But I'm I'm gonna tell them that and, and let them know. <laughs> Alrighty, well, sadly, that is the end of the Q&A, but thank you, thank Emma, you. for making this hilarious Woo! Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you. 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 Thank you.